here this evening. Thank you for coming out tonight. The board will be reserving a half hour at the end of tonight's session for public input to suggest ways to reduce the current budget gap. This will not be a time to voice your concerns about possible cuts. We truly understand that any reduction will have an impact on our district. However, it is our charge to follow the guidelines set up by New York State laws regarding the property tax cap. To voice your concern regarding cuts, you may still do so at the special meeting of the board, which is scheduled for Monday, April 22nd, at the NFA main campus auditorium starting at 6 p.m. At that time, the board will allow an hour for discussion, public discussion and comment on the proposed budget. And after that, there will be a final um, budget discussion by the board before a um, budget is provided for uh, and recommended for adoption on Tuesday the 23rd. The last several months have been very stressful for everyone in our district. We appreciate all of the input that we have received offering options on how to reduce our current budget gap. We look forward to your additional input this evening and also on Monday. April 22nd at 7 p.m. I'd like to clearly state for the record that no one, no one in this room wants to close any of our buildings. As you are all aware, we are under excessive mandates, regulations from both the state and federal level, and these regulations and mandates come with significant and negative impact onto our operating budget. We continue to strive to work collaboratively to arrive at a budget that is fair and equitable for everyone. This budget must ensure that we provide a high quality education for all. We strive to maintain the best possible programs and services for all of our students. At this time, I'd also like to address several items that have been brought to our attention over the past several months. With all of the input we've received, there are many questions that have been raised. I hope that my statements will provide clarification to some of those questions that may have come up. The first thing I'd like to speak briefly about is in regard to the position of an executive principal at Newburgh Free Academy. There has been a misunderstanding that by eliminating that position, there would be a cost savings. That is not accurate. By not having that position, it does not provide any savings. As a matter of fact, by not having that position, it actually creates more of a cost. We currently have We currently have a total of 11 administrators at that building. With the appointment of an executive principal, we will have 10. So that would be a reduction. Staffing levels at NFA in regards to administration. Some of the information that has come forward has been in regards to the Wappinger School District. Let me explain first that Newburgh has uh, two campuses, one high school but two campuses, with approximately 3,440 students. Uh, with the model that will be going into place as of July 1st, one executive principal, two vice principals, and seven assistant principals. That gives a ratio of 344 students per one administrator. Wappingers has two high schools, 
for a total of approximately 4,200 students according to their website. Each building has one AP, I mean, one principal, three assistant principals, and one dean. The purpose of the dean is to handle the um, disruptive students and discipline of the students, which our assistant principals are currently in charge of doing. That gives them also a total of 10 administrators at their high school level, with a ratio of 420 students, uh, 420 students per one administrator. I'd like you to keep in mind that Wappingers does not have the same diversity or the same number of economically disadvantaged students that we serve here in Newburgh. So I took the opportunity to review some other districts that are more reflective of the population that we serve here in Newburgh. Kingston has one high school, approximately 2,237 students, one principal, one vice principal, four assistant principals, for a ratio of 372 students per one administrator. Poughkeepsie has one high school, approximately 1,174 students, one principal, and five assistant principals, creating a ratio of 195 students per one administrator. Middletown has one high school, approximately 2,053 students, one principal, eight assistant principals, for a ratio of 228 students per one administrator. The third thing uh, that I would like to address was a comment we received about when relocation of departments or staff are made within the district. It was stated that there, it creates extensive and costly remodeling expenses. That is not an accurate statement. The only new equipment or furniture that's been ordered has been as a result of renovations done to different buildings in our district and was funded through the capital project. The last time any new furniture was purchased for any staff being relocated goes back to 2003 when Dr. Nick Johns was here and the Board of Education at that time opposed the purchase of that furniture and equipment. When someone is currently relocated, their furniture goes with them or furniture is provided to them from <coughs> elsewhere within the district. The fourth piece of information is around uh, transportation. Several suggestions have been made about the potential cost savings and going back to neighborhood schools. I'd like to first state that when the district's transportation contracts are done, they are done based upon the number of routes. They are not done based upon the distance traveled throughout the district and the distance to transport our students. Also, the district is reimbursed over 90% of our transportation cost the next year. So by going to a neighborhood school, there would not be any reduction in buses because we would still have the same number of routes. We still have the same number of students that have to be transported. And since the contracts are done on a route basis and not a distance basis, there would be no cost savings there. Also, in looking at neighborhood schools and trying to examine what those lines might be, the capacity for each building needed to be looked at. And the number of students living around certain schools far exceeds this, the building's ability to accommodate the number of students in that particular neighborhood. Lastly, regarding that issue, we strive the importance of choice here in Newburgh. If we were to do something like that, and we were to do it via a phased-in plan, we would be transporting our kindergarten students to neighborhood schools while still having to transport the first through fifth graders to their current buildings that they are attending until this whole plan was phased in. Unless we were to move all students at once district-wide. And how disruptive would that be for all of our students as well as their families? Another uh, piece of information that came forward was in regards to the conference budget line items. 
I certainly hope that all of you would agree that it is important for everyone associated with the evaluation of our students, with the education of our students, to receive current information on the ever-changing laws, regulations, mandates, and best practices. These changes occur not only at the state level, but also the federal level. This budget line item is reviewed and reduced on a regular budget. And we also try to procure grant funding to support these initiatives. Finally, the issues to cuts within the budget not being equitably dispersed. We have done our best over the years to not target any one group, but to be very fair and balanced across the board. We carefully review the percentages of cuts across all units. We have been operating without a deputy superintendent for several years. Last year, we had several reductions in our district director positions. We continue to look diligently at, as reductions for away. We continue to look diligently at reductions as far away from the classroom as we possibly can. We are limited in this due to the constraints from the state and federal level. I'd also like to make you aware that the district is currently exploring with all union leadership an alternative health insurance program. This alternative may present significant savings which could affect the proposed 2013-14 budget. Everyone, everyone is working diligently to bring this to resolution. I hope that the information that I have been able to provide to you tonight has been informative and I hope that it has put some clarification on some of the questions and issues that I know are out there in the community. At this time, Mr. Pizzo, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Madam President. Since we had an executive session before and we're starting a little bit late, we're gonna go directly to uh, Mike Pacella, but before we get there, I too would like to say to you, thank you for coming. We look forward to uh, hearing what you have to say this evening and again on Monday night. And that, uh, as, as our president did say in her presentation, nobody wants to close any schools. Nobody wants to cut kindergarten. Nobody wants to cut programs, whether you're in the audience or on the stage. We all have that same goal. However, if you read the newspapers, you see that this is not something that only happens in Newburgh. It's happening all over our state right now. Uh, right in our own area, about five schools have already been closed. Uh, those people did not want to close any schools. I work very closely with the superintendents in our area, and they all have the same sick feeling about what they have to do, what they have to present, and what they have to recommend to their boards. And their boards have the same sick feeling about it. So we are in the same boat. Even though you're in the audience and we're on the stage, we are in the same boat. We are suffering through an economic, well, they're still calling it a recession. There are some people that think it's a depression. Uh, I think most people in the audience are too young to remember that when they're in their 30s. But it was a terrible, terrible time and it seems as though this thing has us around the throat, this financial instability, and it's not letting go. We don't know when it's going to stop, but anything that we can save as we go along, we will try to do in each succeeding year. Again, I thank you for being here. Mike, you ready to go? Thank you, Mr. Pizzo. I'll take you through where you are at this point, and then take you through the packet that you have. Um, we'll start with... Uh, what you've already approved to date. You've approved by consensus $2,166,000, and that was done in February, the last budget meeting that we had. We can't hear you. Okay, try to make it better? Yeah. So at the last budget meeting that you held on February 21st, you, you arrived by consensus to eliminate uh, $2,166,000 through various positions and programs. Uh, you haven't had a budget workshop since then because we were told that during the budget process in Albany that Newburgh could experience a significant amount of money and this was done through certain senators up there and 
that amount that we were projecting was 70% of our gap elimination adjustment. And if you look at your first uh, page that you have here, I gave you an analysis of that state aid compared to the governor's budget, where the governor uh, had presented his package. Then the senator, senators and the assemblies came by and they increased it. However, they didn't come to anywhere near the 70% of the gap elimination adjustment as it was outlined in, in certain statements that they made. And the amount that Newberg received was really just over a million dollars extra from what Governor Cuomo had projected us to receive. We did receive, through the courtesy of the Assembly uh, Scartados, an additional 250000 which takes you to your current general fund aid for budgeting at $122 million. And that's applied now. If you recall, back in February, your original target was nearly $9.8 million. With these figures, your new budget gap is $8.6 million. You deduct the $2.1 million that you've already taken into account, so your current budget gap is $6,391,670, or 6.4 for rounded purposes. Now this is all taken into consideration that you approve a tax that takes you to the legal levy of 5.4%. I've showed you the next page that you have is your proposed budget options. And I just went through this briefly. Your target was $8.6 million. Your new target with what you have is $6.4 million. So now we'll go into the actual meat of tonight. You have a sheet, landscape sheet, labeled summary. And this is what will take you through recommendations by senior staff and the superintendent. Just before the meeting started tonight, uh, we have been in contact, the superintendent and I have been in contact with New York State's Department of Special Schools up in Albany regarding the, the proposed charter school opening in September because we've been receiving information that they are not going to meet their 85% projected enrollment. So through pressure on our part to that department, there's no mandated timeline as to when they can decide if that school can stay open. We received notice today from that department that the charter school revised their charter and has lowered their projected enrollment down to 60 students. Now they still are required to meet the 85%, but through discussions, it seems like they're going to be allowed to open if they get if they get close. Be that as it may, our original budget figure of 105 students at 14,000. Uh, 796 per student obviously can come down now by 45 students. So with that, in your first line on the summary, we're going to reduce the budget by $665,850. Well, that's the money that we won't need to set aside for that charter school for the 13-14 school year. We don't know how many of those students are residents at this point because we haven't received their roster yet. But we've been instructed by that department that they will stay on top of it and they'll provide information as they receive it. Mr. Pasella, can you just calculate, please, the original 1.5 that was set aside minus the 665, so we know the final number that still needs to be set aside due to the state's approval of the Newburgh Preparatory Charter High School? That money being set aside are cuts in program staff and services to our children. That's correct. They also revised their charter for their five-year existence um, to be a total of 300 students. And as I instructed, told you before, that we won't be receiving aid on any of these students until the third year of its existence. <coughs> Excuse me. We are also informed by this department at State Ed that they have strict, they're going to have strict guidance over this charter and they have to adhere to all of the requirements of that charter in terms of attendance and, and grades. So they'll be monitoring it and they'll be keeping close contact with the superintendent for uh, future years um, in their existence. <coughs> I'll go to the second line. It's recommended that two clerical positions, one in this curriculum and instruction and district clerk's office, be eliminated, as well as the executive director of technology. The duties and responsibilities of the position will be distributed as follows. The business office will assume the district technicians with oversight of the district systems infrastructure. 
Curriculum instruction will assume responsibilities for education technology, chief information officer, programmers, data collection, and school library services with the, assist, with the assistance of the assistant superintendent for human resources based on her prior experience as the Newburgh Free Library Director. Through discussions with Orange Ulster BOCES, it was determined that we can currently purchase a service called Model Schools, which assists in the educational technological needs of the district. We've been assured by the staff there that there will be additional support needed for the CNI to deliver instructional technology. The coordinator of family and community involvement will assume the attendance and registration functions. Discussion on this item, please. Broken the mount, excuse me, I, I'm sorry. I've broken the mount separately for separate discussions on your spreadsheet. Okay, so I'll take them one at a time then. Uh, reduction in the budget of $68,569. That would be for a central office reduction CNI clerical position. <laughs> discussion, comments? None. I'll take consensus on that item. Ms. Prokash? Yes. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Woodhall? Yes. Ms. Resch? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. McAfee? Yes. Mr. Lawson? Yes. Mr. Levenstein? Yes. Yes. Next item is a central office reduction of a district clerk, clerical, at a savings of $62,013. Questions or comments on this item? Mr. Howard? Mr. Woodhall? Yes. Mr. Resch? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Ms. McAfee? Yes. Mr. Lawson? Yes. Mr. Levenstein? Yes. Ms. Prokash? Yes. Yes. Next item for recommendation is a central office reduction of the Executive Director of Technology for a cost savings of $195,452. Comments and discussions on this item? Mr. Woodhull? Yes. I believe this position. I believe in letting this position go because it's a real serious problem for our district. We're being asked in the year 2014 to make all our tests be, be computer generated and for every student to take the testing on the computers. We are also at that point that if the computers are not set up properly, we will not have enough data capability to take it accepted into the system. And we can end up in a mess that I don't even want to think about because I've seen in other places. Second of all, we're just trying to introduce now our iPads to who I believe it's the sixth grade. And without a technology instructor, I think that is just absolutely foolish. Uh, the one person that just school district needs right now is technology. These children know more about technology than we do. I know I more than I do. Because I go to some of the youngsters and they fetch my computers. So, yeah. um, but uh, I think we are making a very, very serious mistake in uh, doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Resch? Uh, I had the same concern. Any research we do anywhere we go, technology is, is the cutting edge of education. And if you guys can just go through again how we're going to cover what this director does. Um, uh, uh, just to reiterate, Tom said, I mean, that it's all about technology today. And Lord knows the kids more than, know more than we do, but we need somebody on the cutting edge to keep them on the cutting edge and, and also to educate our teachers on how to educate them. So. I, I, can, I can only speak to uh, business office functions. The technology department, as as we believe, is there's the infrastructure, which is what Mr. Woodhall is explaining regarding the setting up of the, the computers, 
the, the telephone systems, the um, server systems, and then there's also the educational side, and, and we understand. Uh, and unfortunately, the assistant superintendent for CNI, Mr. Fortin, is not here tonight to explain how that happens, but he has had discussions with the Orange Hills Debosi's plan, and this model schools assist in just that. Questions or comments? Mrs. McAfee. I actually have a question uh, about the, the uh, savings uh, because I'm looking at the amount of savings that this will generate and wondering what it costs to purchase the service called model schools. It's, we currently have that built into our uh, BOCI services. Oh, so we're already getting it? We don't we're have getting, to purchase we're, something? Right, we already have. Right. Michael, is part of that training then for, is that program, that BOCES program, part of it training for the teachers and for, uh, and the tear down effect? Do you know what I mean? I do, and unfortunately at this time I can't answer that. Uh, we can take that question back to the CNI folks. And I know we're trying not to bubble, so, but can we bubble so we get those answers? Mr. Whitthall? I also have a real problem, Mike. Uh, in it, every school district is going to be taking exams on the same day at the same time. I have absolutely no faith that both seasons can even come close to demanding all the school districts and all cover all the problems that could possibly be at one time. It's just unfeasible. Okay. Mrs. McAfee? I thought Daniel was here. Here. Daniel's here. Uh, could he answer our questions? Um, Dr. Shanahan, can you answer any of these? The CNI um, responsibilities for technology would have to be shared among the uh, CNI staff <coughs> in central office, uh, as well as dispersed through some of the staff in the schools. Um, along with um, some of the teachers on special assignment and increasing the responsibilities of the remaining staff in the Office of Technology. We would have support from model schools, um, but a lot of the responsibilities we would all have to take on ourselves. Yes, Mr. Lawson. I'm sure concerned about the uh, technology officer. I also wanted to raise... I share a concern about the technology officer, but I also wanted to raise a question about the coordinator for family and community involvement. We, we know how important family uh, parents are in the educational process. So to burden, I'm, I'm trying to be clear about exactly what we're asking this coordinator to do in addition to what you know, already taxing the job that she has or he has. Like the break, you're asking about the breakdown of and the divvying up of the responsibilities that the the uh, technology director is currently taking care of. She would manage. There's currently a registration uh, department there, as well as an attendance. Uh, although they have been diminished over the years through budget reductions, so she would be managing the, that department. There's currently a department that does that. So she would, and it's housed in the same building that she's in currently. So she would see, she would be the management oversight of that department. Ms. Rich. I have a question for Dr. Shannon. In, um, you said model school. Can you explain to me what our, or your definition of a model school is? And I'm only asking because in our continuing education as board members, model schools as we're taught are high tech, cutting edge, always expanding and growing and staying on that. Exactly, and it, it, the term model schools in this case is not used that way. Model schools is the program at the BOCES to help school districts with their uh, technology infrastructure and the use of technology for educational purposes. So they provide professional development, technical assistance, they can act as consultants who come into the district and help us do what we need to do regarding our technological infrastructure. So it's not like 
uh, building a, a technology-rich school that would be a model, like a model school. So in that way, it's a misnomer. Thank you. Yes, Mrs. McAfee. I actually like the division of, of duties. It seems to me to make a lot of sense. I think the issue that probably is behind the, the, all the comments is that, that we need reassurance that the folks in those offices can really handle the additional duties. Isn't that what's behind this? Yes. Uh, no, and, and yes. only you know that. Now, we're, we're in a kind of position to be able to answer our own questions. When we did the breakdown and the build back up again, we feel that we're adequately covered with this outline that you see in front of you. Otherwise, we would not have presented it tonight. Mr. Levenstein? Yes. Mr. Prokash? Yes. Mr. Howard? Yes. Okay. Um, 
you have a packet. In, inside your packet, you have state C labeled F. I just want to just state for the record when you read out these savings, these amounts, these are not salaries alone. They're salaries plus benefits. Thank you for that clarification. Sorry, total package. Okay, item F uh, was brought to you before, and the original recommendation has now been revised by the curriculum instruction along with the acting principles. And this is with regards to the NFA recommended curriculum reductions. There's an attached letter that will outline the revisions and the rationale behind each. If you recall, at the February workshop we brought to you, and there was some questions and concerns regarding the breakdown of the House and Academy structure. So the schedules have been reworked and remodified, and uh, you'll see through this letter from CNI uh, and the principals that it will maintain the House and Academy structure, but be a little bit more efficient on the schedule. This reduction would be about 14.4 teachers uh, at a cost of $1,377,000, I'm sorry, $1,377,162. Questions or comments on these? Yes, Mrs. McAfee. So this would be a collapse of certain sections? We don't each have a microphone, so we have to share it, move it back. <laughs> uh, so this would be a collapse of sections that would allow the reduction of staff. Uh, I don't see Daniel out there. Where is he? Oh, he's on the other side. By collapse of sections, do you mean increasing class size? Uh, well, to start with taking sections that have a low enrollment and then collapsing them, you know, mm -hmm. combining mm -hmm. them, and so you'd end up with class that, yes, mm -hmm. had a larger class it size. It is that, and it's larger class size, looking at a, a cap of 30. 30. Yeah. But I see above, Daniel, I, I'm looking at the letter that comes from the administration and, and particularly uh, CNI and, and the principals. Uh, a statement that's very important to me, based on the numbers above, the house plan at NFA Maine and North will not be affected. And if you remember previously, that was a concern that I had raised. If we have small sections, I can understand that we might need to collapse them. But I was bothered by the possibility of affecting a plan that took years to establish until we get a long range plan of what we would do instead. So I, I think that, that that part of, of the house plan needs to go into a planning phase perhaps. But I, I could, you know, look with reason, I believe, on, on the reduction of staff if you assure me that, that it is the small sections that are causing this issue. Correct? That was the work that we did looking back at the numbers to make sure that the structure of the houses that we have presently would not be affected. It would remain the same as they are today, only there would be a collapse of the smaller sections and an increase in, uh, in class size in some cases. And, and it's, it's all right if I comment on the fact that to, to, to have the largest cuts in English and, and math is perhaps counterproductive in terms of the test scores. You know, so that we're going to have to watch this very carefully. Now, we, we may be saving money, but we may have bad test results as a result. The, the numbers that we looked at allowed for the reductions that you see here. Um, there were no departments that were, that were particularly um, targeted. We looked at every department looked at aggregate numbers, uh, divided the numbers, not just evenly by, um, by section and, and by house, but looking at the kinds of course offerings that were there uh, and the possibilities for increasing the class size of many of those classes. I know, and That's and where the numbers came from. Yeah, but I, We're but not I happy with them either. I am looking at no reduction in science, two reductions in social studies, but four in math and four in English. And what I'm just looking for is the assurance that, that we're going to have the coverage that we need so that the children get instruction that's required. Yes? Yeah, that's the, 
if, if that weren't the case, we wouldn't have put these numbers forward. Exactly. So I was going to say, similar to what was stated earlier, this is the recommendation from the superintendent who, in collaboration with his staff, has gone through and provided us with what the class sizes would look like moving forward. So that's all for it. And I think I'm just reiterating for everyone's you know, benefit that, that we would go. You know, be reducing you know, the number of teachers, that would increase the class size, but that it would not affect the house plan. Mr. Lewis will watch it very carefully. Mr. Lewis. I can agree with what Judy's saying in terms of the superintendent making a recommendation and that guy that said I would go along with the superintendent's recommendation, but on this one, I must change my my, my feelings. If we have fifty percent of our minority students are not graduating. And if we're going to make the classes larger, I mean, I don't see how the minority students could get to pass anything. I mean, especially math and English. I mean, they're having such a right, a rough time right now, even uh, uh, passing one course. And, and now you're going to put 30 kids in the class, and these kids can handle it. Dan, do you want to respond to that? No one is in favor, in principle, of increased class size. You know, that's a given. Along with these recommendations uh, is a, a reworking of the AIS system. So that, whereas now we have many classes that where we say our, the students are provided AIS, um, where the model we're using is not the most efficient model. If we would target the students who truly need AIS in, say, a separate location or with additional services in ELA and in math, we could see we could implement some of these recommendations, these these reductions, and still provide maybe even more effective and targeted services. So it's not just a numbers issue that we're looking at and class size. It's also how we are using our AIS teachers and how we can better use them to, to target the needs of the students. Would you explain the AIS? Uh, so, we all, so we all know what to do. AIS is the program uh, where students who meet certain criteria, for example, if they score a level two on the state test, uh, or if they do not pass a regents exam, are provided in theory, are provided supplemental services to get them to score higher on the regions or higher on the state test if it's a K-8 program. Um, what we're doing now at the high school is giving them, uh, is, is having them work with two teachers at the same time rather than have them work with one teacher and then in addition work with another teacher for those supplemental services. So, they, so the, these students, this possibility that they would Acquire these services because they're not passing the grade. Absolutely, they'll, they'll get the services, and it'll be in a different way than they presently get. Thank you, Dan. Let me add too that when we say when we put a number of thirty down, it doesn't mean that every class is immediately going to thirty. We are not we are not going to exceed thirty in the classroom. And as you all know from the numbers we've been showing you the last couple of years. Many, many of our classes were undersubscribed, as they were, and they were not cost-effective. I hate to use that term, cost-effective. It's an industrial term, but it really applies here when you're running out of money. Thank you. Ms. Rush? Um, Daniel, what you were, as you just explained it, that's what Silly uh, or Ms. Rumley's been working on, right, with, with all those new tests and applications of the ASI? AIS, sorry, sorry. AIS, yeah. There is some overlap, um, but this program is separate from uh, programs for students with disabilities. The students in the AIS program, as we have it here, are not students with disabilities. They're just students who are, who are underachieving. 
So there, there might be a little bit of overlap, but it's for That's my for, question, is the overlap, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really for a different population. Other questions or comments on this item? I will take consensus on the NFA recommended curriculum reductions for a savings of one million three hundred and seventy-seven thousand one hundred and sixty-two. Ms. Resch? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Ms. McAfee? Yes. Mr. Lawson? Yes. Mr. Levenstein? No. Ms. Prokash? Yes. Mr. Howard? No. Mr. Woodhull? Yes. Discussing his spreadsheet or work. That meeting. motion carried. Thank you. Uh, the next item we'll be discussing is uh, labeled L. Apologize for jumping around, but you'll understand. Uh, we've already approved some that were in the other packet. These are items that have been brought again, and some are new. L speaks to the recommended reduction to supplies lines across the board, it's a 10% reduction. Supplies have been diminishing over the past couple of years as a budget reduction plan. This 10%, now not all lines can obviously be touched because there are some aidable lines that are generating revenue based on our local effort that we're required to spend. Um, for example, the E-rate, which is for part of our infrastructure and our technology throughout the district, we're required to spend a certain amount. So that amount of savings and the net reduction for supplies is $209,209. Questions or comments on this item? None. I'll take <coughs> consensus on the reduction of most of the supply lines for a savings of $209,209. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. McAfee? Yes. Mr. Lawson? Yes. Mr. Levenstein? Yes. Ms. Prokash? Yes. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Whithall? Yes. Ms. Resch? Yes. Yes. <coughs> Next item, labeled M. Reduction of the extra earnings budgets. Analysis of reducing the extra earnings, this was done per the board's direction. The analysis of reducing the extra earnings budgets by 20% was done. This uh, attached spreadsheet will indicate the lines that can be reduced, but will also indicate the lines that can't be. Uh, certain contractual obligations prohibit the reduction of this, but the amount of savings is $364,408. Questions or comments on this item? Okay. And I'll take consensus on the reduction to overtime budgets for a savings of $364,408. Mrs. McAfee? Yes. Mr. Lawson? Yes. Mr. Levenstein? Yes. Ms. Prokash? Yes. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Woodhull? Yes. Ms. Resch? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Yes. Okay, the next three items, um, there is no spreadsheet, but we're recommending a reduction of $10,000 in textbooks from St. Joseph Schools. This was in the budget this current year because we didn't know where the enrollment was going to end up once that school closed. Now we have that indication, and this was again 
brought up through suggestions, and we did look into it. So that recommendation is being brought to you, that 10000 Also, uh, suggestions submitted by the board uh, for further analysis to possibly reduce the unused sick time buyout lines. That can be reduced by $30,000 because each bargaining unit was analyzed, and certain budget lines have exhausted uh, that opportunity for that. Also, there were some retirements within those codes. And lastly, of the, those three, the curriculum and instruction department has indicated that there are currently 11 instructional coaches in the district that support the implementation of the Common Core modules and other district required professional development tasks. These positions also support school-based professional development and individual teacher coaching and mentoring. They're proposing reducing the number to nine, which are all funded by grants and deploying them as follows. There'll be two for the K-2 curriculum, be two for the three-five grade curriculum, There'll be two for the grade six, eight curriculum, one for the nine, 12 curriculum, and Temple Hill School will be supported uh, with two by the SIF grant through June, 2000, June 2015. The total savings in the reduction of coaches out of the general fund will be $187,469. I'm gonna take these items one at a time. The reduction to the budget line for textbooks for St. Joseph's Reduction of ten thousand dollars. Any questions or comments on that? <coughs> Consensus. Mr. Lawson. Yes. Mr. Levenstein. Yes. Ms. Prokash. Yes. Mr. Howard. Yes. Mr. Woodhull. Yes. Ms. Resch. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Mrs. McAfee. Yes. Yes. Next item is reduction to the sick leave buyback budget lines. It would be a reduction of $30,000. Any questions or comments on this? <coughs> Consensus, Mr. Levenstein? Yes. Ms. Prokash? Yes. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Woodhull? Yes. Ms. Resch? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. McAfee? Yes. Mr. Lawson? Yes. Yes. And the final item is a reduction to uh, of instructional coaches uh, going from 11 to 2 that would be a sick cost savings of 187 11 to 9 sorry uh, 11 to 9 reduction of two instructional coaches at a cost savings of hundred and eighty seven thousand four hundred and sixty nine dollars questions or comments on this item yes mrs. McAfee I think it's a clarification that I'm seeking. Did I understand you to say that, that the, the nine positions are funded by grants? Yes, all, all nine will be funded. Uh, with Seven of them are funded by title grants, and the two additional ones that were brought in this year to support Temple Hill um, will be supported by the SIF grant. All right, then, then this, this is where I'm going with this. When the time comes that the grant is up, does the, whoever is on the board at that point get a chance to vote on those positions again? Well, what will happen? Do they just get folded over, Mike? That's, no. what, that's where I'm really going. No, they won't get folded over into the general fund. That's that's not the way the, the system works. Um, when we fold, when going back to the original process to set the budget up, when we do this, we roll the general fund budget, salaried items into the general fund budget. And then we'll look and, then and analyze the grant funds that we have, which are almost $20 million to support the general fund on top of this. We'll analyze when those grants sunset and who's, who's in that budget. Um, and this worked with the federal grant, with the um, magnet that went away. The boards at that time, when that money went away, made the decision to still maintain the magnet team to a certain extent of what we can afford, and so it certainly has been modified. So these are constantly happening. We're constantly losing grants, but we're constantly getting grants. So these will not automatically be folded into the general fund. They'll have to be readdressed in March and April of 2015. Okay. I just want to caution everybody because it, it sort of occurred to me after six years on the board, I didn't re ever remember a time when I was asked to, to approve something moving from a grant funding over to the general fund. And, and so I wondered how it came you know, to be. I don't think we've lost that much um, in, in the terms.
terms that you've been in. We ever lose those grants, then this is becoming very dire. Other questions or comments on this item? And I will take consensus on the reduction of instructional coaches by two at a savings of $187,469. Yes. Ms. Prokash? Yes. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Woodhull? Yes. Ms. Resch? Yes. Mr. Lewis. Mrs. McAfee? Yes. Mr. Lawson? Yes. Mr. Levenstein? Yes. I just want to make one more comment. Actually, during your tenure, we did lose the jobs restoration for federal money. So there was $3.2 million worth of salaries and benefits that you did have to decide because it was put into the general fund budget, but then you had to make do the same process you're going through now to reduce those positions. So. The federal restoration money wasn't specifically earmarked for any type of position. It was just to restore uh, jobs. But once that money went away, you had to decide on what you're going to keep jobs in. So it's kind of that same premise, except with grants, there's very specific to titles. So we would have to bring them to you. Okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Lewis says that we did. Uh, so yeah, we will be watching very carefully. Yeah. Okay. Um, at this point, Madam President, um, you have most of the recommendations. You've accepted what's been presented, which totals 3170000 of additional reductions, which brings your to-date total of $5,336,371 of reductions to the budget. If you recall in the beginning of the session, I said that you needed to find $8.6 million. So your budget gap now is $3,221,538. At this point, I'll turn it over to Susan Penn. Thank you, Mike. I'm going to make a recommendation to the board here after I go through the next four items. And uh, I'll give you the reason why. Uh, quite simply, uh, we have another school in the audience tonight, I have members from another school, who have not had an opportunity to uh, present their case. So they will be speaking tonight, and um, we have another session set for Monday night to hear people and uh, from the public. So before we make a move on these next four items, I would like uh, those people to have an opportunity to speak and be heard by the board before you make that decision. Also, another reason why I'm making this request tonight is that uh, we will be negotiating with the NTA again tomorrow. Uh, we, we negotiated on Tuesday. And as a good faith gesture, I don't think we should be voting on closing any buildings or reducing any kindergarten sections until we, we do that meeting with the NTA tomorrow. You know who the three which three schools have been up? Uh, reducing the kindergarten to half day program is also on the list, and the elementary class adjustments, the moving up of classes. So I, I would ask you, uh, Madam President, if we could table these items until after the people are heard tonight and the people are heard on Monday night, and we negotiate tomorrow. Because I see you right in the front row looking at. I'd just like to, before I take consensus on, on uh, tabling those items and, and hearing from the, the community tonight and, and on Monday, um, I'd like to just share with everyone the cost savings associated with those items that the superintendent just spoke about. <clears throat> the cost savings associated with the closing of Horizons on the Hudson is $4,550,000. $552,354. The cost savings associated with closing Bonville is $4,372,541. The 
The cost savings associated with closing Vail's Gate is $5,163,375. The cost savings regarding the reduction of kindergarten to a half-day program is $2,939,673. And the cost savings of elementary class adjustments would be $654,595. I will now take consensus on tabling these items for consensus until Monday evening after we've heard from the community and the public at large again this evening and after Monday's special meeting of the board. Mr. Howard? Yes. Mr. Woodhull? Yes. Ms. Resch? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Mrs. McAfee? Yes. Mr. Lawson? Yes. Mr. Levenstein? Yes. Ms. Prokash? Yes. Yes. Thank you. So what's the next bit of the 22nd? I'll stretch it out here. Okay, at this time we will start our um, half hour of hearing from the public on ways to reduce the current budget gap. We will be allotting three minutes per speaker. We kept on the time here on the screen. And I do have a list of names that were taken on a first come, first served basis as received by the board clerk. First, we will hear from Mr. Darren Stridire. I'm sorry, before you get started, Mr. Stridire, I'm being told that we actually have 45 minutes. So we can give 45 minutes instead of 30 minutes this evening to allow for more input from the public. Ready? Go ahead, Mr. Stridire. Thank you. Uh, well, based on those numbers that you just gave us, uh, basically if you close the, you have the half-day kindergarten and the elementary school adjustments, we don't even have to be here for closing schools, so that's just one option right there. <laughs> it's only five days from the board's official vote on the contents of the 2013-2014 budget. It is clear that whatever input the public has at this point, would be very difficult to implement. So, with that in mind, I'm just gonna give some ideas for the budget process. Immediately solicit volunteers to participate in the budget committee. This committee will request and review monthly expenses and its relationship to the line-by-line -line budget, making the board aware of red flags and suggest ways to save the district money. Begin an open dialogue with the contract vendor to discuss ways to streamline operations and use technology to save money in the long run. Immediately work with our unions on a long-term plan for benefits, long-term, and other items where costs are expected to increase greater than the tax cap. Establish a priority system for all non-mandated programs to assist the board and district in deciding future budget cuts. The process to determine priority will involve investigating each program for its effect effectiveness and preparing our students for college. For long, too long, our students have been given low expectations and this must end. All of our students are capable of greatness and it is our job to help them attain that goal. To make, make a budget workshop schedule next year and keep it unchanged. Postponing meetings due to lack of information from the state is just an excuse to ignore the public. Yeah. Investigate the interest of our other school districts in forming a purchasing cooperative where supplies such as custodial, property maintenance, food service equipment, office equipment, and even copiers can be negotiated with more purchasing power. Yeah. Request a meeting with Central Hudson to evaluate each building for energy efficiency and apply for any rebates we qualify for. Consider installing a water well at each school for use 
For non-potable items such as lawn watering and general cleaning, we could cut down on our city water bill. Investigate the hiring of private companies to perform custodial, food service, facility maintenance, and grounds maintenance. And I can offer one item concerning this year's budget that can be impl implemented now and eliminate individual programs before eliminating entire schools. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stradion. <coughs> Ms. Julia Gomes Perot. <coughs> Going through the budget and attending some of these meetings over the past several months, I've been struck by the number of consultants and contracting agencies and coaches that have been in the budget. Now, you talked about that some tonight, and I can appreciate that many of these positions are grant funded, and we certainly want to take advantage of that. But as was discussed in one of the earlier March budget meetings, there certainly can be a conflict of interest in some of these agencies diagnosing issues that they then miraculously have the answer for. So the board discussed this and I would just like to say I fully agree with continued uh, inquiry into conflicts of interest with many of these for-profit agencies and the need for having what again appeared to me to be quite a few coaching and consultants and, and all of these people. And I would also say that as a parent at Horizons, I've become more familiar with the International Baccalaureate Program. And we've heard a lot about how this program can support teachers, how it supports students and gets results. But I think what maybe people don't realize is the cost effectiveness and cost saving possibilities of this program as well. And I wouldn't like that to get lost. I understand that the board will be listening to further presentations about the International Baccalaureate Program and again, uh, I would encourage that. And related to the issue of exploring the International Baccalaureate Program is what I as a parent and voter and taxpayer would encourage. And that's more <coughs> long-term strategic planning. We're talking a lot about short-term fixes. And we certainly need those, and we understand that. But I think our concern is that we are going to be in this same place next year and the year after that. And we can't have this continue to happen. I know that the system may not be set up for strategic long-term planning, but we need it. And again, as voters and taxpayers and parents, we demand it and we hold our board accountable for this. Again, back to the International Baccalaureate Program, I would like you to consider expanding this program throughout the school district because it has a proven record of success as well as cost savings. And failed schools are the biggest expense of all. Good evening, my name is Art Clickton. I'm president of the Newburgh Teachers Association. Uh, in, in hearing what this uh, budget workshop has been dealing with, one of the things that obviously is at the forefront is that jobs will be lost. Teachers will be laid off from positions that they have been in. Before, I had suggested that the uh, board consider a retirement incentive as a way for the district to save some money by taking the uh, teachers at the highest pay levels, letting them retire gracefully, and allowing younger teachers who are paid less to remain on staff. not only a cost-saving item. This allows positions to be lost through attrition. It lessens the devastation of teachers being laid off. It allows for continuity in classrooms with younger teachers and their students, and their students can see them again the next year. And I think that it would behoove the district to consider this seriously, 
and offer this incentive so that we can protect our younger teachers. Thank you. I'd like to speak, uh, have Mr. Pacella speak to that a bit because the board has discussed this. Mr. Pacella? Yes, there's, in doing the analysis of the salary differential along with the benefits that would have to be provided to the retiree, there is not, there is no proven savings in that venture. The current contract reads the 40% incentive on the salary. The differential now, because of the cuts over the past couple of years, we don't have that many new teachers or less expensive teachers. The salary differential is not there and there are no proven savings to offer that incentive. Yes, we have offered the um, retirement incentive in the past that we're still paying for now. Ms. Michelle Ryder. to Ms. Buchek's comments at the beginning of the meeting, I changed the budget issue on which I plan to speak tonight. I had originally intended to speak on the issue, uh, similar to Julia's, on keeping HOH and its IB program open as really the best tool that we have in this district to combat the infiltration of charter school initiatives by raising the level of performance in the district. We may be dodging a fiscal bullet this year on the pending charter school initiative, but you can be assured that this isn't the last we're going to hear of it if we don't raise our performance. When Ms. Fuchek spoke tonight on the issue of neighborhood schools and busing, it really struck a chord and caused me to change my thoughts about what I wanted to speak about. We absolutely cannot continue to count the budget <coughs> year by year by looking only at a single year budget. We have to consider the long-term academic and economic impacts of these decisions. Just because the state currently funds 90% of our busing costs does not mean that this is going to continue. If nobody's noticed, the state is out of money too. It would be foolhardy to think that your state will continue to fund economically inadvisable decisions and waste forever. I believe the comment that was made tonight was that certain students would be underserved geographically if we moved to a neighborhood school district. <coughs> Based on the 2011 census data, over 45% of school-aged children in this district reside in the city of Newburgh. When the time comes to address the inevitable pressure from New York on our transportation costs, we will be in worse shape than we are now if we close yet another school in the city of Newburgh. We've advocated, we've advocated for months for the academic and demographic reasons to keep horizons open, but in looking at district residency and considering the cost of transportation, I think it would be economic suicide to close HOH. In the minutes I have left, I just have to say after attending the last several board meetings and researching the budget history and data, the salaries being paid to the teachers and administrators in this district are very high. They far outstrip comparable private sector jobs in the region. It's really distressing to see us cutting a really important position for technology. Um, we have very, very high salary costs, and I understand that they are contractually driven. But we can't afford to hire necessary positions because of the already high costs. It's time we have to address the overall compensation and benefits in the district. And I urge this board and any upcoming union contract negotiations to carefully look at these issues, limit all contract renewals to one year at a time, and be very, very cautious when considering short-term savings like the retirement incentive proposed and look at the long-term costs. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ryder. Ms. Robin Guzman. Um, and I thank you for sharing um, and highlighting some of the central office 
um, cuts and sacrifices that are being made. Um, because that was one of my concerns for sure, um, similar to what you were saying, that the, you know, I think of it as concentric circles with the student in the center. So the people who have the daily interaction with the student and, you know, things like class size where students are most directly impacted, that's who we're here to serve. Um, and so the, you know, the people on the outermost rungs, you know, we're talking about the technology director, I share, you know, Mr. Woodhall's concerns, but at the same time, if we're also talking about um, closing schools versus, you know, a position that, you know, can maybe be dispersed, and you know, these are these are hard cuts. Um, you know, as far as the the um, super, I mean, um, conference budgets and things like that, we do need training, but we can also look at ways that maybe that the coaches um, can be and the teachers can be sharing best practices. A lot of times, you know, teachers are kind of like, oh my goodness, we have another conference today. And, you know, for lack of a better word, feel like it's a waste of time. And I feel like if if the, the conferences can be more structured um, where it's daily practices, where maybe other teachers, you know, I've been to where, you know, other teachers are sharing best practices at Central Compact and we're all inspired. Um, and so I feel like, you know, those might be some places where there can be some um, cuts made. I would also like to speak to um, IB as the International Baccalaureate Program does incorporate certain things like um, character education and things that we're buying sort of piecemeal. Um, it addresses Common Core. There's um, a share space um, that would be that is included in it where units are shared from, amongst teachers. Um, so those are ways that some of these things that we're sort of buying it as um, separate things are all incorporated into that program. Um, I also just wanted to suggest that we do as much community outreach as we possibly can to get buy-in. Um, when meetings are canceled, it makes it hard for people to know, you know, what's accurate information, as well as the greater community who has to vote on possible tax increases but if we know what we're paying for, we may be willing to make that kind of investment. So um, whatever we can do to communicate um, broadly with everyone to, so that everyone is most informed um, about what the sacrifices are and what the contracts are, um, what's at stake. Nobody wants to pay higher taxes, but what's at stake um, if, if, um, if Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I did sign a petition to support um, a budget um, advisory committee um, in the future, and that's something that we've spoken about before. Um, I know it was suggested at one time and sort of decided against, but I, I really hope that in the future that be another place for a clearinghouse, you know, on the blog, or not blog, but on the district website where we can post questions. There's not a conversation, you know. I mean, today you answered it, but it was two months worth of questions. So okay. just as a suggestion. Thank you very much, Ms. Guzman. <clears throat> extensive research on the evaluation process that should be utilized when considering a school for closure. Our research shows that there are multiple factors that should be considered as part of this process. We are here tonight to present to you solid research and data which make a compelling case that Bonville should remain open. Based on this research, 
Bonville does not fit the profile for closure. And Mr. And Ms. Moorhead is going to continue on some history of Bonville. And after that, Mr. Grant is going to give you more evidence why this is the case. Thank you. My name is Alexandra Moorhead. I'm a Bonville alumnus and a senior at NFA. Thanks to the education I received at Bonville, I'm currently ranked first in the class of 749 students and was offered admission to Harvard. My brother Adam, who graduated from Bonville in 2005, was a valedictorian at NFA in 2011 and is now a student at Yale. In, 18, in 1859, Bonville was established on the Desmond Estate as a two-room schoolhouse. In 1897, FDR's aunt, Miss Annie Delano Hitch, granted funds to build the first new Bonville school on land donated by her family. Since then, the community has invested in many times in the growth of Bonville. The first of several additions was Oh, I'm sorry, the last of several editions was added in 2007. Bonville has a long history of service to the community and charity that continues to this day. Our PTA is now 75 years old. At Bonville, we develop real relationships between faculty and families that follow students beyond its walls. If you close Bonville, Newburgh will lose a school at the heart of this district. For 154 years, Bonville's high expectations have produced students like me with a strong foundation to build on. Like our tree, Bonville's roots of caring about children run deep and long. We are Bonville. And as you will see, there are many, several pictures, thanks to the students from Bonville, illustrating the fine history that our school has had. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to give some uh, shout out to the uh, people who put this presentation together. We spent a lot of hours uh, gathering data and facts of what you're going to be presented here in the following. Thank you, Ms. Moorhead, and thank you, Mr. Bell. Hi. Mr. Dennis Grant. My name is Dennis Grant. And I'm here, to, and I'm on. I'm here on behalf of my three children who attend Bonville Media and Communication Center. I'm here to tell you that this school is a model of academic achievement, cost efficiency, culture, and history. First, Bonville has high academic standing. Our school has been recognized by this board as a high-performing, gap-closing school and determined determined by New York State. Bonville is one of three schools in our entire district that is in good standing on New York State's school, schools in need of improvement list. Bonville has achieved federal adequate yearly progress every year since 2001. Second, Bonville's population is very diverse. Ethnically, almost 75% of our children are non-white. Our staff is also ethnically diverse. Culturally, our students' families come from over 18 countries around the world. Socioeconomically, 60% receive free and reduced price lunch. Geographically, the majority of children reside in the city of Newburgh. Third, third, Barbara's average suspension rate is consistently lower than the average rate of other elementary schools in this district. Our 10 year commitment to positive behavior intervention support the longest in the district saves the district the cost of home teaching and superintendent hearings. It, has, it also helps move the district towards compliance with the state mandate to offset disproportionate suspension rates. Fourth, Bonville's cost of operation is among the lowest per capita. Its per student cost is lower than the average per student cost of any other small school in the district. Based on data available to the public, Bonville has the lowest annual, bu and annual budget for supplies. We share staff and technology. At $700, we spend less than one quarter of 1% of the district's conference budget. We have zero dollars in miscellaneous expenditures. Our utility bills are consistently lowest per capita. Despite our frugality, Barbara continues to meet and exceed academic expectations. Fifth, our, our building is one of the most modern in the district. We recently completed a $6 million state-of-the-art addition that has allowed us to add classes to each grade level and to absorb the district's pre-K program. Sixth, Barville has one of the largest green spaces in the district. This gives students significant opportunities for outdoor learning and urban students a chance to experience nature. 
We recently received a grant to over, over 3,000 hours to break ground on a learning garden. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grant. Mr. Arturo Santana. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, my name is Arturo Santana, and I'm a physical education teacher with a uh, graduate degree in special education at Bonville School. I'm here to tell you today that Bonville is a model of academic achievement, cost efficiency, culture, and history. I'm also here to tell you that it does not fit the profile of a school that should be targeted for closure. We know the decision to close the school is anguishing. It profoundly affects parents, neighborhoods, communities, district personnel, and of course students. It affects relationships and routines. It alters not only district operations, but lives. According to a recommendation by the New York State Department of Education and other educational departments throughout the country, it is imperative that the decision to close the school is made using a, strate a strategic, strategic, methodical evaluation process. Key criteria that should be considered as a part of the process include, number one, academic performance. According to established national standards, schools that should be considered are those that consistently fail to, make, to meet specific annual state and federal performance targets. Bonville, by contrast, is the top three performance school in the district. Number two, cost efficiency. Higher operating costs can mean that a school is disproportionately eroding a district's budget and costing the taxpayers' money. As you heard from Mr. Grant, Bonville's cost of operation is among the lowest per capita. If you are looking for cost savings, cutting one of the most efficient schools would provide the least impactful savings source. Number three, building conditions. Buildings in need of significant upgrades or repairs are simply less economical to maintain. Further studies show that students learn better in more modern buildings and that attractive, well-designed, well-kept schools are a greater community and educational asset. According to a recent of a, a study from the Organization of Economic Development and Cooperation, modern buildings are, quote, a strategic plank in education reform efforts because upgraded schools are better places for teaching and learning. Preserving modernized facilities can be a better long-term district investment, both fiscally and academically. In, in year 2007, as you know, Bonville completed a $6 million state-of-the-art addition that made it one of the most modern facilities in the district. It consistently receives public accolades on their parents and has won horticultural awards for its garden. They are some of the key metrics that should be considered when evaluating a school for closure. According to established national standards, based on these metrics, Bonville should remain open as a model for excellence and a vibrant and dynamic part of the community. Thank you. Mr. Jeff Lease. I'm Jeff Lease, the father of three of Bonville students. I'm a commercial broker with Lease Real Estate in Newburgh and a registered architect and member of the AIA. I think closing schools to balance the budget is a poor real estate decision and I'd like to propose a possible solution. Several years ago, we voted for smaller learning environments and funded a reorganization of the district and attended facility upgrades. We are now faced with an extraordinary shortfall that forces us to compromise that long-term investment. As much as I do not like to address speculation, there has been talk that the administration hopes to move into a closed elementary school. And after having funded that restructure with my vote and backing that with tax dollars, I, I cast my vote for classrooms and not offices. If, in fact, this does occur, I can tell you that part of the trust between this voter and the Board of Education will be compromised by a bait and switch. If you close a school, you might as well sell it, given the district's uh, past history in closing schools. After $6 million in renovations in Bonville, it is probably one of the poorest choices for closure. With large green space, little deferred maintenance, and an outstanding bond of $6 million, Bonville is, is one of those real estate investments worth retaining. 
In fact, we must not really vote <coughs> any of our schools. It is really counter to everything that we have voted for in the past, and in my opinion, it's a disastrous short-term decision. My proposal is to exceed the state tax cap. I know that we're past our deadline, and I know that, uh, uh, but the, the, the state budget has come out very late, and I think we, we might have a chance of going up there for an appeal. I propose we petition, petition the state to keep the real estate and the investments that we have in our children with these schools. What makes Newburgh unusual and valuable is in fact its excellent school district. I can tell you that as a real estate broker, that many people come here outside of the district. And this district has always chosen a path that is different from other districts and that other districts have shied away from. I question the wisdom of savings that run counter to our core mission. Don't close any of the schools with the quality that we have funded to this point. A deficit should not make us make force us to long to short-term financial decisions. Allow us to move forward and pay for the quality that we voted for and have since paid to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Ms. Courtney Baxter. kindergarten in September. Um, <clears throat> he attends a pre-K program in a daycare in Newburgh. We do not utilize the pre-K program through. <clears throat> we do not utilize the uh, Newburgh pre-K program because of its half-day uh, program. <clears throat> As an alternative to having half-day kindergarten, my suggestion would be to remove the pre-K program from the district entirely. There are multiple daycares in the district who offer a pre-K program that is full day and comparable to the half-day program through the district. Some of them even teach their students the curriculum handed down through the Newburgh Board of Education. In the event the kindergarten program went to half-day, there are no programs in the area that offer half-day um, daycare to kindergarten-aged children. When discussing the idea to make the kindergarten program in our district half-day, there are multiple reasons to maintain <laughs> full-day status. For example, Children who attend full-day kindergarten have, one, higher long-term achievement, higher reading scores in early grades, fewer grade retentions, and higher test scores. They have greater progress in social skills, more in reinforcement of positive social behaviors, higher self-esteem, and independence. They have greater achieve, uh, creativity in more relaxed, less hurried school days that offer more varied experiences. They are more prepared for the transition to first grade, and they are equipped with stronger learning skills. They have higher academic achievement in later grades and better attendance in kindergarten and through the primary grades. Um, Burmerton School District in Washington, Washington State studied the impact of full day kindergarten to half day as the children progressed in first and second grade. The findings showed that children who were in a school who were in school a full day performed better in assessments than students who went to only half day. The difference between the two groups was also seen all the way into the fall of their second grade. In my opinion, kindergarten is the basic building blocks to our children's education. To take that away from them and only offer them a half-day program would be detrimental to their education, to their future. My son, he deserves a good education. Newburgh has always offered a full-day kindergarten program, and I think you should continue to offer it. Thank you. Mr. George Eliadis. <laughs> Hello, my name is George Eliadis. Hello, my name is George Eliadis in favor of my school, HOH Elementary School, proud design and primary school's t-shirt. Why close Horizons? Why close any school? Education is a wonderful thing and is the profound base of anybody's future. Can you imagine the disastrous impact on the community closing Horizons would have? 
take this into consideration. It is only elementary school still left uncondemned in the city of Newburgh. Wow. Horizons has provided me with way more than just an education. It has given me some ideas for what I want to be in the future. For example, last year I had written an excerpt which I later built up into an actual story. Instead of receiving just a simple pat on the back, my library teacher helped me take it to the next level. She gave me a website where I could publish my book, and I did end up doing so. And if you close horizons, there will be many kids who will not get a chance to experience what I have. And think about this really well. Why close horizons? If a student were to put Newburgh on the map, he or she would be an alumni student of Horizons on the Hudson Elementary School. Thank you. Hello. I would like to make five suggestions for improvement in the Newburgh School District's budget process. One, start budget planning earlier. Why wait for the state numbers when well, these numbers are quite predictable? Make a best guess and start planning from there, perhaps September. Two, make multi-year plans with realistic projected costs. Certain aspects of past budgets, for example, keeping the tax levy increases very low, while at the same time spending $2 million from reserve funds, only made sense with very unrealistic, rosy projections of the future. At this point, it would take fantastic increases in state aid and or the tax levy to be able to replenish reserves and at the same time cover normal growth in the district costs. Three, present more information to the public. If you don't know what the public would like to know, please consider asking. Another strategy might be to ask yourselves what should the public know about this and see to it that that information is available. Number four, figure out some way to reply to suggestions. I appreciate the effort at the beginning of this meeting to begin to do that. I would only add that uh, a commonly used device is to offer a FAQ document, F-A-Q. Some other school districts, uh, and that stands for Frequently Asked Questions. Many other districts have quite lengthy facts that address, that address questions from the public regarding budget processes. And number five, if it is necessary to take drastic steps, such as close schools or eliminate programs, please think about what is the best way to inform the public about why such steps are necessary. In the spirit of setting high expectations for everyone, please consider these suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Ms. Melissa Lamarck. Mr. Thomas Buffamonti. All right, actually, I'm representing Bell's Gate, but I'm not going to really speak about the school tonight. There was just a few things as far as, one thing as far as savings and another important issue I'd like to speak about tonight. Um, one thing that the district may want to look into, I don't know if it would be feasible for new birds, but um, I know the district has been working on energy conservation and has considerable success with this initiative. Now I've learned about um, something, solar farms that are gaining popularity and can be installed on open property or on the roofs of buildings. 
I first learned of this actually reading in the news how the city of Middletown plans to utilize a solar farm to reduce um, energy expenses by a lot. Many other municipalities and school districts throughout the country are beginning to consider this option. These solar farms, based on the research I've done, tend to last for about 25 to 30 years and are often funded partially or fully through government or private grants, so it may not cost the district anything. If the Newburgh City School District spends, I think the number, I could be wrong, but I think it's somewhere in the range of a million dollars per year in electricity for all the buildings, this could greatly reduce energy costs and create a huge savings over the long term. Um, Lawrenceville, New Jersey schools are developing a solar farm that they anticipate will reduce their energy expenses by 90%. Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania school district expects to save over $18 million over 20 years. So this wouldn't have any immediate savings, but for the long term future, it may be at least something for the district to look into and see if it's something that's feasible. It could save a lot of money over the long term possibly save a lot of teachers, teaching assistants, keep class sizes down, maybe even help to save a building one day. Now with that, speaking of saving buildings, we saw West Street close a few years ago. We're looking at the possible closure of a building again, going to half-day pre- or half-day kindergarten. All these things are disastrous. And it seems like we're seeing a decimation of the public school system in this country. You know, it's not just Newburgh, it's not just New York State, it's the entire country. We're seeing cities, Detroit, Chicago, all over the place, schools are being shut down. And I really think it's time people talk about holding the school board accountable, but I think the school board is honestly trying to work hard. Everybody has, you know, we all have our little things we could say, but we really have to start holding our public officials accountable because they're putting all these things on the properly funded. This is where it's coming from. We also see these charter schools. Now in Newburgh, the charter school was had good intentions and it's a great idea, but unfortunately it's hurting a lot of students. Now there's another elementary charter school possibly coming down the line. Some of these charter schools in other parts of the country, not in Newburgh, but in other parts of the country are for profit. So you've got these, and you've got chains of charter schools, like Walmart's and charter schools, giving public tax dollars and making profits off of this as we see our public school system being privatized. This is a huge problem and we really need to hold our public officials accountable. Um, after uh, recently attending a national conference, Diane Ravitch spoke at great length in regards to the um, efforts among the privatization of, of, of public education and the efforts among our public officials to move in that direction. So thank you for sharing that, Ms. Resch. Also on that note, what we also found out was um, I, I believe it was last week, Chicago closed 54 city schools, 54 in the city of Chicago. It, it, it is national, and you're, you're absolutely right, and we have to just keep rallying on a, on a higher and higher and higher level before the whole country is privatized, and it's going to be all about entrepreneurship instead of education of our kids. gone through my list. Um, we have about five minutes remaining. If there's anyone else that would like to speak on suggestions and options, please come to the podium and give your name and address. Uh, my name is Mario Acosta. I live at Vales Gate School. <laughs> It's in my heart. There's nothing else that more to be said. Um, just following on what uh, Tomas mentioned, I think we need to go to Albany. A lot of people are going to Albany. It's a question of gas money or a car. We'll take mine. I'll go. That's all I have to say. There we go. Right. Yep. That's it. That's all I want to say. We, we need to we need to make more noise. If they put a, a property tax cap 
why can't we put a tax cap on the lottery winnings and funnel the rest of it into education? What can someone do with $200 million in the course of their life? I just don't see that. Thank you very much. This will be our last speaker for the evening. Good evening, board. My name is Denise Bell, and I'm a parent of Bombell students. I'm also one of a member of a group in Newburgh called Mo Better, Mothers and Others for a Better Newburgh. And we are encouraging this board to act to consider some long-term planning. Mothers and Others for a Better Newburgh is calling for the Newburgh and Large City School District Board of Education to establish a district advisory committee effective immediately. The DAC would be tasked with formally evaluating the district budget deficits, researching options for reducing the deficit using established national criteria, and making informed and transparent budget recommendations in an impact study for the school board and the community at large. MOBETA has established a petition urging the school district to take this step. The petition can be signed digitally, I can't make the other address, or can be accessed by going to the petition site.com and entering Newburgh and Large City School District in search box. The Board of Education is currently considering several extreme budget reduction measures that have tremendous negative implications on our entire community, including the possible closure or reduction of full day kindergarten to only half. Measures like these should not be considered on an arbitrary basis with little to no transparency. They should be strategically evaluating hard empirical evidence and based on broadly supported incontrovertible conclusions by, made by the members of the community using industry standards and best practices. According to industry best practices, measures involve involving potential school closures and other potentially significant budget cuts should be considered by members of the community via a DAC for the following key reasons. A DAC is specifically tasked with finding and assessing facts at a higher level than a detail than a at a higher level of detail than a school board using transparent evaluation criteria re recommended by back but I'm oh, sorry recommended by best practices. The utilization of a recommended criteria to evaluate potential cuts makes a DAC recommendations more strategic than an approach that uses limited arbitrary data. The DAC is comprised of a wider range of key community stakeholders and operates independent of the Board of Education. It is a less political body and it is more credible. The DAC is accountable for transparency to the public and the school board at every step in the fact-finding and assessment recommendation process. According to the research conducted by MoBeta, New York State law states that trustees or Board of Education of a district in which any school closing is being considered are authorized and recommended to establish an advisory committee on school building utilization and investigate the educational impact of such a closing at least six months in advance of a closing. As further evidenced by national best practices, thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. spoke this evening to um, provide a copy of what you shared with us to our board clerk if not this evening you know anytime or you can do it via email but I would encourage that so that we have that um, for review I'd like to thank you all very much for being here with us this evening and I would just like to remind you that um, there are two other meetings coming up um, one will allow for public uh, comment that will be Monday, April 22nd. There'll be a special meeting of the board at 6 p.m. at the NFA main campus auditorium. The purpose of that meeting is for public discussion and comment on the proposed 2013-14 budget and the final board discussions around those items that we were presented by the superintendent this evening. Also, um, uh, for your information, Tuesday, April 23rd at 6.30 p.m., there is a special meeting at the NFA Main Campus Auditorium that there will be no public input at that time, public comment period, but that is for the purpose of adopting the 2013-14 budget. That will be followed by the regular Board of Education workshop. So I thank you all for being here this evening, and I look forward to speaking with you in